This is Betty. I'm the witch from the north. And I'm Lancel, the island witch. And, and you're, you're listening, listening to Rosemary, Rosemary by, by the, the Bucketful. Bucket Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Rosemary by the Bucketful. Today, we are talking an about the importance of queer and BIPOC inclusivity in the witchcraft and occult communities. We do have a special guest joining us, which my co-host Lancel will introduce in just a moment. But before we begin, we do have a disclaimer for our listeners. Today, we will be discussing some important and sensitive topics, and we would appreciate if our listeners could maintain a respectful decorum in the comment section of this episode. Please note that if you do attempt to comment racism, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, or otherwise hateful comics comments, they will be removed and you will be blocked immediately. Lancel, would you like to introduce our guest? This week we are talking to Austin. You know him as Bainax Bramble on Instagram. Gorgeous. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone uh, is doing well, uh, whatever time you're listening to this. Uh, my name is Austin. Uh, I run the Instagram page Bane and Bramble or Bane X Bramble on uh, Instagram and uh, yeah I do a lot of things and among some of those things uh, folkloric witchcraft uh, is one of them. I uh, practice a very um, local and land-based practice. I live in the United States. I live in Florida um, or central Florida and yeah <laughs> Thank you so much, Austin. Um, so we're really excited to have you here with us today to talk about uh, this uh, topic that we've chosen. We believe that it is an important topic, uh, especially among our community to discuss. Um, so thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, so I would like to start the discussion with a question. Um, so my question is, what is witchcraft and spirituality and who is it for? Oh, I think that's a very, very big and nuanced question that I think when you start to define witchcraft in one broad stroke, um, it's going to get a lot of different answers. I think I'm very quite staunch in my own personal opinions on what witchcraft is that I think sometimes um, is quite deviated from this perception that we have in our modern era that witchcraft is uh, really any sense of spirituality or alternative spirituality. Um, and when you take a historical approach to witchcraft, that's not necessarily true. Um, witchcraft historically by uh, well, by definition, you would find that it is just somebody who practices witchcraft uh, uh, is, and that's what makes a witch uh, by, <laughs> by a, a textbook definition. And unfortunately that doesn't give a lot of context into what that actually is. But when you start to take a look at texts involving historical witchcraft, not saying that I practice necessarily a historic witchcraft, but, um, a historically based, uh, historically inspired craft, I should say. It is, um, it is quite transgressive. It is uh, quite evil to some, especially to the overculture, to the church. Um, it would be deemed as uh, somebody who is against the community, somebody who uh, practices malefica or um, evil magic who steals babies and makes butter go sour and kills cows um, and, you know, blights crops and things like that um, and causes harsh winters and death. And in a personal practice, in a historic look, while I definitely am not um, doing things that I personally think are, are quite evil, I think if you asked any member of the clergy or maybe even some people off the street, um, I would be considered quite a evil person. And um, I lean into that a little bit, I think, but I, I think of myself as quite a good person. 
Um, <laughs> so it gets a little a little nuanced, but witchcraft, in my opinion, is um, a transgressive force that straddles in between the overculture. It is a heretical force that uh, as, asks questions and defies the oppressor. It spits in the face of uh, white capitalist heteronormativity. And, um, and, and in that sense, I find that it is uh, definitely considered quite evil by many people. Um, and like I said, I, I do quite lean into that. <laughs> I thought you were going to say make butter out of babies. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love what you said there because you are absolutely right. It is very nuanced. Um, historically, witchcraft has always belonged to the outsiders and outcasts in our society. It's been a way for the marginalized and oppressed people to take back control over their life and stand in their personal power. Today, it's not exclusive to the marginalized people. And therein, I think, lies the beauty. Um, but again, it can be very nuanced in terms of exclusivity. And when we talk about exclusivity, there inevitably is going to be somebody that is going to be hurt in that process. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, again, nuances within that. Um, much of our practices today, and of course, outside of us, uh, traditionally enforce and adhere to the same hierarchy that we face at, at large in the world, which is a hierarchy that isolates shame and hurts those living beyond society's binary and boundaries that, by the way, are human-made constructs. But to go even further, um, our society has been built on white supremacy and therefore has centered the cis-het white perspective which ex this is exactly what we're going to be addressing in today's episode, as well as the impacts this has on our community as a whole, but also within the LGBTQ and BIPOC communities in our spaces. Um, I also liked that you had noted that, um, Austin, that it is, from an outside perspective, um, if we go into uh, the perspective of the church and that overarching um society, uh, um, for lack of a better word, um, we are looked at from the outside as as evil, as doing something evil, as uh, straying from the norm of society. Um, so I liked that you had mentioned that. Thank you. Yeah. I think that, you know, when we, this uh, particularly, particularly, and I can only speak from an American perspective, um, but there's this anomaly that's occurred within the past 300 years or so. Um, and it really, in my opinion, began around the uh, industrial and scientific revolution, which kind of uh, were parallel to each other. Um, that there is this, uh, and ironically, from a scientific perspective, God, it was still very uh, deocentric, right? And still uh, very Abrahamic in its perspective. But what happens is that we've really quite divorced ourselves from the other and the spiritual world. And we start to take away and start losing an animistic perspective of things. Um, and I, I definitely want to say that I uh, am, you know, of course, um, very amazed by science and, and modern medicine and, and things like that. So I'm not like bagging on uh, science and our advancement in our uh, in our modern world. But I do think that along with this has come a lot of problems because we have divorced ourselves from um, these conceptualizations that um, things are living beyond us and that there is much more to the concept of life beyond just human consciousness, beyond just mammalian consciousness, beyond just, um, you know, plant consciousness. It, it's very funny because with a lot of, I think, newer studies are coming out, the perspective of indigenous culture and also, um, you know, just animistic culture as a whole, there is a lot 
of new information that's like, oh yeah, this is, uh, you know, this is there. This is scientifically like hypothesized to be true. This is, um, you know, maybe we can't explain exactly how it works or maybe we're trying to quantify that information to explain how it works, which I think is equally fallible. Um, uh, but I think it's just a little ironic because it's like, yeah, we've been, you know, we've been reclaiming that for, or I'm sorry, we've been, we've been saying that for a long time. And, and, you know, you're just now being able to scientifically prove some, some particular aspects. And again, I think when we start to quantify this information, it, it gets um, uh, really tricky, but uh, I digress. I agree. Um, we have come to a space where now um, individuals are seeing the validity in not just scientific, but also in the magical. And they're also realizing that there is an overlap there. Um, of course, we're not always going to be able to prove something with 100 apps. 100% absolute certainty. But I think that just because something is beyond our perception does not mean that it is invalid or that it doesn't exist. And I think that that's kind of where we're coming to that crossroads between the two. So um, definitely a great point. Thank you. I also agree. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I think maybe we can start talking about some of the exclusivity and the centering of cishet white voices um, and how there's been a lot of whitewashing of cultures and traditions over the last century or so, because um, I definitely think that that's something that's important. Um, personally, I believe that the witchcraft and pagan community as a whole has made some strides to become more uh, queer, inclusive, and center BIPOC voices. However, we still have a long way to go. And as an example, um, we could talk about appropriation of certain cultures and traditions that we see within our community. Um, so as said in previous episodes that Lancel and I have had, there's absolutely a difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. Um, and people take it a, a, too far or they take advantage of that. So for anybody who's unaware Cultural appropriation seeks to further oppress a marginalized group by profiting from their work, traditions, tools, spiritual philosophies, and so forth. Um, and we see a lot of that because there is so much crossover from diaspora, uh, diaspora uh, of, of cultures, of people migrating, uh, of folk practices. Um, sometimes there are lines that can be blurred. Uh, but I think it's important for us as a community to address those issues, especially when um, it's so rampant. That sounds bad, but especially for uh, beginners and uh, new age uh, practitioners. And I'm not hating on new age practitioners, but a lot of the new age practitioners, and I myself began my practice in the new age realm, um, there's a lot of uh, appropriation uh, within there um, that needs to be addressed so yeah and my first note on that would be whitewashed authors or authors having more recognition that are white than people who are actually from that culture and making profit from that culture and I think it can be somewhat antithetical because when we talk about Topics like folk magic, it's in the name, it's folk, you need to learn from that culture. And it's not only about skin tone, it's about people who aren't in that culture or who aren't well versed, making profits out of something that they don't really know about. Right, and there also becomes a line where, you know, we have somebody who is not from a specific community, we'll take like the Latinx uh, community, for example, in Brahelia. We have, you know, authors who are white, who are not part of that culture, um, who have maybe studied some stuff, um, and I'm not going to go into like where the resources come from, but um, their voices are being centered over people from the Latinx community. And that's a real issue. Well, Austin, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, to take that even further, right? So when we take a, a little bit more of a closer look at uh, cultural 
appropriation right there. It's it's such a, a trigger happy topic right now. And um, uh, even, even with me, right? So I, I've talked about it in the past and things like that while trying to be very careful because I think what happens, especially me being a white um, queer person or, a, you know, even a white cisgendered person, um, I think we, it, it, it walks this very, very fine line, right, between not only just white centrism, but also white guilt too, as well. There's a lot that happens when um, there's a lot of, especially particularly here in America, and I get asked, you know, often like, oh, hey, you know, I'm on American soil and I am really trying to, you know, connect with this land and connect with these spirits um, and even connect with the folklore. But a lot of the times um, it's, you know, very uh, Native American stories that are, are held here and, and things like that. And how do I go about that? What do I do with that? And I'm like, well, um, which of course, you know, I, I try to be very sincere and gentle uh, about what I have to say, but at the same time, it's it's kind of like you do have to come from a place and, and mm, uh, am I allowed to be spicy on this podcast? Be spicy. <laughs> I think, thank you. Um, I think it's really important for people to get over their white guilt because what happens when we start addressing white guilt and, and saying, well, I don't know if I feel so comfortable with working with these spirits or I don't want to step on any toes or anything like that. I think it's quite important to really listen to the people that are aware these um, stories, where these practices, where these ideas are coming from and not to appropriate them or take them or steal them or make them your own. But I think you need to get out into the land and you do need to address the absolute problems that we have as a colonialist society uh, that we have as a white supremacist society. And I think that needs to be addressed, but you can't um, come at it from a place of trying to appease some guilt that you have. Um, we're past sorry, we're past, um, you know, I, I definitely believe in, in reparations can help, but at the same time, we're very much so past reparations in, in some way, shape or form. I think because you don't get to apologize, you don't need to apologize for your ancestral lineage and ties to white colonialism. How are you helping the indigenous people? How are you helping queer, trans, black, indigenous people of color? Uh, we're, uh, I think um, we get caught so caught up in saying, I'm sorry. Uh, but again, stop saying you're sorry, get up and do the work get up and stop feeling guilty about it and get your hands dirty. There is enough sorries being said. You're not going to erase the fact that um, indigenous people have been treated beyond poorly, uh, that genocide has happened in this country, that genocide continues to happen in this country and just on a smaller scale and is not looked at critically by the media and instead stand up, ask how you can help, listen to the people who are in, who need the help and, um, and don't come at it from a white savior complex, sit down, shut up, and then go and get your hand, just hands dirty. I think that's going to be very important. Yes, absolutely. And you mentioned um, a great point. Uh, there is that, First of all, that that white guilt, but also that white savior. Okay, so I realized that I've contributed to this. So now I have to go and stop this from happening or save uh, the people that this is happening to when we're not supposed to be at the forefront of this. We're absolutely supposed to help, um, but it's not for us to be at the forefront. We're supposed to be here uplifting those people in those communities to, to help make the changes necessary so that we can stop these this genocide from happening and these atrocities from happening. And the way that we do that, as I said, is by centering um, 
those people in those communities and uh, uplifting them, I think is definitely a starting point. Yes, I think in for the sake of time, unfortunately, we're only going to be able to touch on some of these things. Um, and that goes, uh, reminds me, we are going to be having a second part to this episode where we're going to bring somebody in from the BIPOC community uh, as well. So again, we're for the sake of time, we're going to be touching on a few different topics under this, um, what's that word I'm looking for? Umbrella. Yes. Um, one thing I did want to mention, though, is accountability. Um, we need to hold people accountable um, to make the changes necessary. So, for example, if you're noticing that um, the majority of the books out on a certain topic are white voices, reach out to the publisher. You know, um, make an effort to hold them accountable and make them aware that they need to change this and 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 center these um, Latinx voices, these um, um, indigenous, indigenous uh, people of color. Um, we need to be uplifting those and centering those uh, those voices in uh, instead of bringing in uh, white people and white voices. Uh, so yeah, moving on. Um, we're going to talk about queer representation in mythos and its erasure to suit the conformity to the binary. I think this is also an important topic under inclusivity uh, in our community. So, Lancel, did you want to start off, start us off with that? The thing with gender in metaphysics is that it's not really the same as gender in the mundane sense. When we talk about, and I want to reference to Kabbalah, the divine masculine or the divine giving is ever giving and the divine feminine is ever receiving or ever forming. It's not really the same thing as male, female, non-binary or gender fluid. Um, yeah, absolutely. There, there, up until I would probably say, I don't know the specific date, but up until recently, fairly recently, um, We'll take Wicca, for example. They, they focus on duality of the god and the goddess. Um, so somebody who is within the LGBTQ community um, who maybe identifies as being non-binary, who is maybe a, a transgender person, um, they may not, one, feel accepted, two, identify with that dualism, um, and I think over the last little while, there has been some strides, as I said previously, into becoming more inclusive and not focusing so much on the binary or the dualism of that and, and making space for, you know, transgenders, individual, transgender individuals, gender fluid, gender nonconforming, and so forth. Um, so there has been stride, but there is still obviously room for improvement. Yeah, when we talk about Wicca and gender, um, there's this whole ordeal about um, I think it's Gardnerian initiate, initiation, uh, where a male initiates a female or female initiates a male. But the problem comes when someone's non-binary or is trans. And it got nuanced and confusing for a while, but it ended up being that most people, the initiate decides who the preferred gender or who there is going to initiate them. Absolutely. Um, t we take Diana Quick, for example, where um, for a time being, they were opposed to having uh, transgender women within their uh, covens or uh, practices. So, um, I mean, there has been growth in that respect, but it's still within our history and it's still something that we need to be aware of moving forward so that, you know, we can address them and act accordingly. Um, Austin, I want to hear some of your thoughts on this. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you, I am speaking particularly from my ex experience or from my, I'm sorry, from my perspective as a queer um, gender non-conforming person. <clears throat> I think 
uh, I'm, I'm always going to try and reference history when I speak on these things, right? And also um, trying to provide some resources to look into, or at least some people to look up to. Um, I think there's this dichotomy, particularly in the Western occult space that um, we're really un unfortunately quite rigid in our perspectives on gender. But I think that's, again, quite an anomaly within the past um, uh, perhaps 1500 years or so, because what you actually look at when you look at the roots of culture, um, the language up until a lot of colonization that occurred, um, particularly from, from what I've found by the, the um, British Empire, the the language of the people um, had room for inclusive language, right? I particularly want to um, talk about India uh, before it was uh, colonized by the British. There were and there um, there were languages, there were words that encompassed gender non-conforming people. Um, I'm not an expert enough to speak on what these things are, but I, I know um, a lock. Vim and on uh, on Instagram, uh, they speak particularly well and are, are quite knowledgeable on um, these kinds of topics. But I think what happens is that we get very, very tripped up in this dichotomy of like, well, how maybe not particularly how we get past this, but like, I don't know, there, there's such a hang up and uh, it's difficult for me to really quite get get past this hang up just because um, or I'm sorry, not not to get past this hang up, but to look at this hang up because in my perspective and, and a lot of people have asked me to define a lot of these things or how do we combat these problems? And I, I really have quite a simple answer is like, stop thinking so much about it. Um, and, that, and I don't mean to think critically about it. I just mean like, again, no more. Listen to not only the people, but the spirits of a place, right? Um, spirit defies gender. I particularly like what you had said, Lancel, about particularly in, in Kabbalah, um, you know, the, define, the divine uh, giver and the divine receiver, right? So when I speak on these things, I really try to adapt my language, right? And spirit has... Um, or I'm sorry, spirits have come to me and, and definitely made the presence known. I am masculine or I am feminine, but there is room for that uh, deviation from those two binary norms, right? So even in adapting my language to a magical practice, I think is very important because language, the way we write, the way we speak um, is very important and very telling. Um, I've had lots of people recently uh, speak on, uh, very kindly and very generously and graciously speak on the way that I write and the way that I speak. And uh, I do appreciate that, but it does come from a place of acknowledgement, um, trying to better hold a perspective for the freedom of um, the non-binary, right? And I mean that in the greater sense, not necessarily of a person. I mean the non-binary as what deviates the two conceptualizations of masculine and feminine and where that treads that in between, which in my opinion is where witchcraft lies. And it is in my opinion that witchcraft is inherently queer because it defies those two binaries and um, <laughs> particularly, I think it de it definitely leans more feminine, but to to remove itself from that gender, um, that gendered frame of thinking, it treads a path that is gender non-conforming in the way that in the way that the language of witchcraft is, I should say. And I don't know if I'm making any sense and I might be running on a tangent, but my point being is, is that there, the in-between space that is witchcraft, right? The liminality, um, this straddles 
uh, the two binaries and walks between them and amongst them, both in language, both in practice. Um, and I think that's very important. I 100% I agree with everything you said. Um, I think the idea of the divine as a singular cis het white man um, is fairly modern in the context of history and religion. Um, so uh, I always found it interesting that that was something that was uplifted. Coming from an evangelical family, uh, Christian family, um, that never really resonated with me, with me. I always viewed the divine as as all encompassing, um, so to speak. So they, them, there was no sort of one or the other. It was everything. Because if you look at us in, as individuals, we also encompass that, you know, uh, as you said, we have both feminine mas and masculine uh, receiving and, and giving energy. So for us to, uh, to force ourselves into uh, this, these labels or these boxes, um, I feel really has a negative impact and limits our practices or our, our power. Um, and if, I mean, if you take um, the, co the context of mythology and, and Celtic mythology, for example, the Fey folk were known for their lack of sexual inhibition and disregard for gender in their intercourse. So, I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> and it's not only like whitewashing incomprehensible like deities, it's also people like whitewashing Jewish people in Christianity. We see that a lot. And it's like weird, and I don't know why it's done. Why um, it just perpetuates the white savior complex? That's exactly it. It does perpetuate the white savior complex, and I think it um, it's very. It, I think it was used to push forth a certain agenda. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it. It's. I think really, when you look at it from a historical and anthropological perspective, it 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 is to fit and frame a narrative. But also, in times you you know you look at um, particular saints, uh, folk saints, uh, Marian apparitions, and things like that. And sometimes, particular like it, for example, like. Um, uh, Oh, I can't think of the the particular Marian apparition that I'm thinking of right now. But um, you know, you do find, uh, you know, in Christianity too, um, you know, Jesus does have an overlay, uh, particularly in art, where you know Jesus might be represented as a black man or Mary as a black woman, or or you know, um, going beyond just race right and it can quite fit culturally to that particular culture and perspective so not to um you know bag on the jesus and the mary i think they're they're quite um dynamic figures and how they present themselves but yes i think by the unified body that is the church um that gets that's where it gets into a lot of tricky trouble where you do have this uh, appropriation or not not appropriation but um this white uh savior complex we could also um talk about with inclusivity comes exclusivity and the nuances of that yeah absolutely i um i actually just recently read a blog post by megan from brown the cauldron and uh, it's titled i am a gatekeeper which I'm sure is going to be a little controversy, controversial for cer certain people, but um, I agreed with the blog post. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. Essentially within it, she says that, yeah, essentially within it, she talks about how um, she's the gatekeeper of her community. Therefore, it's her responsibility to make sure that uh, sexism, racism, homophobia, xenophobia, so forth is not welcome and not tolerated within her community. Um, and I think that that, she made a great point because it's definitely our responsibility to call out those types of um, behaviors and hatred and ideologies um, and weed it out of our community. So in that sense, there's going to be some exclusivity because we're excluding those people. But at the same time, it's also necessary for us to create a safe space. Yeah, absolutely. I, I honestly, I think, 
I find it hilarious, like absolutely hilarious how, um, and it, you know, I, I don't, I'm not in, I, I have to say I'm very uh, closed off from the greater quote alternative slash occultism slash pagan slash witchcraft community, right? I, I do a very specific practice. I, most of my followers are incredibly like-minded people. Um, uh, I'm quite intolerable, I think. So I don't, I don't think that people who don't share my views uh, won't follow me for very long. So um, when I say this, you know, I'm not like super knowledgeable in the greater whole of, of the rest of the quote community, um, which is totally fine with me. I, I love that, uh, uh, that I'm quite intolerable. I think that's hilarious, but I find it funny that um, gatekeeper, right, uh, end quote, is a uh, almost like a slur now, like it's almost like something that somebody will use as like uh, a way to say like you're not a, a a nice person. I find that ironic. I find that hilarious. I I absolutely am okay with uh, gatekeeping. Uh, I, I think you know my my upbringing as a child was like if I had a question, I would be asked to just go look it up, right? Um, not because my parents were mean or malicious, but because they wanted me to learn how to find that information for myself. You don't get to be at a school or a university and ask your teacher all the questions. You don't get to ask the educator or the professor when you're doing a research project, I need help with this, tell me the answers. No, you go find the source yourself or you listen to the source yourself, right? So I find gatekeeper to be a hilarious term. I think it's uh, quite stupid, particularly. I, I, it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. Yes, I will be excluding you if you do not um, fit in, in the particular frame that I'm working with, which is, um, you know, my, my practice is, is founded on queer rage. My practice is founded on uh, destroying the, the oppressor. Um, my my practice is, is very land-based, right? And it makes absolutely no sense why I would allow or tolerate, not even tolerate, right? Like allow, like I will just shut it down completely. Um, anything that has to do with, with something that um, is, is not tolerable to my practice and not only my practice, but also my, my way of thinking in my life. Like I, I just, I don't, you made a good point. I don't mess with it. Yeah. Um, you made a great point that um, there is a sense of entitlement, especially, and I'm probably going to get hate on this, but essential, especially among the white community. We have this sense of entitlement where we're expecting others to educate us on what is okay and what is not okay, what we are allowed to know and what we're not allowed to know. There's always been gatekeepers within cultures to keep certain practices, traditions, ceremonies, and so forth within that culture and that community for good reason. You take the indigenous community, for example. There, there have always been people holding um, their traditions and their ceremonies sacred and away from the general population for a reason, because they are, they have experienced that mass genocide and um, appropriation of their culture they have every right to. And us as a white people, we are not entitled to that information. And we have to accept that some things are just not for us and not for our consumption. Yeah, I agree. Have you ever given thought to why there are so many fascists in like the Norse pagan community? Like the whole idea with going against the grain and not believing the mass belief brings in conspiracy theories and the idea of root races like in theosophy. If you see um, what's happening to like the Norse community, it's gonna be like um, you see the whole idea of blood quantification um, and excluding like BIPOC people from practicing Norse paganism because um, they think that black people weren't pagan or weren't in Europe. I have seen some uh, some stuff in regards to that in terms of. Um, like you said, trying to exclude BIPOC people from um, the Norse uh, religion and, and uh, 
tradition and studying and so forth. And I think uh, historically, as you said, I, I don't think there's accuracy in that. Um, and again, I think it's just a way to um, force a bigoted agenda. Um, okay, so I think we've covered uh, a really good base for this episode. I wanted to maybe move on to some uh, resources or book recommendations for our listeners. Um, so Austin, I think we'll let you go first since you're our guest. I actually just got a, a book in the mail um, and I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but it is fantastic and uh by the looks of it from the the bit that i flipped through and the uh chapters uh contained in it in the table of contents it is titled witchcraft and the gay counterculture by arthur evans a radical view of western civilization and some of the people it has tried to destroy um it is published through contagion press um and I, I don't, it, it was, I guess, originally published in 1978 by a, uh, a publishing company called Fag Rag Books. Um, yeah, it is, it is a really fantastic. Um, along with those books, I also uh, bought um, some books. Uh, it's part of a trilogy series called... Um, uh, queer heresy, queer time travel, and uh, queer nihilism. Um, so I haven't gotten a chance to read them yet, but just based off of everything that I've seen, I highly recommend them. They they seem like really fantastic books, so please check them out. Um, awesome. That sounds really great. Is there... Um... Is there any podcasts or websites or people that you think our listeners should uh, look to follow? Yes, um, there. Oh, God, there's so many people. I, I wish I could name every single one. Some of the people who come off up off the top of my head uh, would be um, Alok V. Anon. Um, uh, they're on Instagram. Um, as well as uh, Astara from Snake and Wild Roots. Um, I highly recommend their work as well as uh, Maya. Sorry, give me just one second to- And for our listeners as well, um, we'll be uh, doing our best to include links and resources in the show notes for you. So if you're looking to- uh, purchase a book or find a podcast or a person, uh, check out the show notes. Yes. And, and, um, Maya Kalaria as well, who is a, um, author, uh, a poet and, um, not necessarily a magical practitioner, but, but does write heavily on rage, grief, um, and all of those wonderful things. So I, I recommend all of those people as well as countless others who I could, say and wish I could name literally every single person who has informed my practice, who has informed my perception of the world. Um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful people. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Austin. Um, I'm going to give a few recommendations and then Lance will, and then we'll end the show with our uh, information where people can find us. Um, so my first recommendation, I actually just received this book and it's called Queering Your Craft by Cassandra Snow. The foreword is written by Matt Oren. Um, I just started reading, reading it, so I haven't gotten all the way through, but from what I've read, uh, I'm really enjoying it and I do highly recommend it. Um, it's a great book. Um, Cassandra, uh, is non-binary. I believe that's how she, uh, they identify, um, and then my next recommendation would be um, Liv Lilith Dorothy. She recently wrote a book, Orishas, Orishas Goddesses, um, and Voodoo Queens. Um, that's highly recommended as well. Um, so I recommend you go checking her out. I'm going to include some links with um, multiple uh, book recommendations in the show notes. I'm not going to really list a specific book, but... Um, buy from authors which you know are in that culture, like J. Allen Cross, yeah, who wrote a book on American Brujeria. So I suggest reading that. Excellent. Um, as I said, we're going to try to link everything in the description below for you. So please, we encourage you to check out those resources. Um, 
As an end off, we usually like to give our takeaways for this episode. Um, I know that it was a long one, but if you have anything specific that you'd like to say to our listeners, Austin, um, this is your opportunity. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. Um, I would say be well, do horribly good things, Uh, get your hands dirty stop apologizing so much and just do the work and also uh witchcraft is an experiential practice and you don't get to learn witchcraft from reading a book well said um and do you want to give our listeners your uh handle for i know that we already mentioned it but just in case um they missed that yeah so uh it's bane x bramble on instagram that's really the only social media that i use um at present moment um and my name is austin uh please uh reach out to me anytime uh i'm i'm basically attached to my phone uh unfortunately (laughs) but um yeah send me a message uh i try to respond to every single person uh and not like my dms aren't swollen with with um direct messages. So please uh, message me anytime. Excellent. Um, I'm just going to give my takeaways and then Lancel, you can do yours. Um, I agree. uh, Witchcraft is a practice. So um, like Austin said, you have to practice. Um, Know that we need to be uplifting the LGBTQ and BIPOC voices in our community um, and centering them. And also to go along with what I said earlier, we are Um, are not entitled to something. They're inevitably going to be gatekeepers and they are there for a reason. It's not a derogatory term. It's there to keep the cultures and traditions safe and within the community that they belong in. And my take would be stay knowledgeable, learn as much as you can, and will is as important as intention. So if you can, take action. Great. Um, you can find me, Betty, at uh, The Witch from the North on Instagram and on YouTube, Lancel. And you can find me on Twitter, Lancel D, T H E, and Instagram. And you can find our podcast on Instagram as well at Rosemary by the Bucketful Podcast. Mm-hmm.